Welcome to Nano Hub U. My name is Peter Brumel. I'm an assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering at Purdue University. I'm here today to talk about nanophotonic modeling. And in this class, we're going to uh, learn about how to use simulation to reach your research goals, and particularly to start developing uh, a bigger toolbox for nanophotonic modeling and simulation, and not just to have that toolbox, but also to understand exactly how to use it. And ultimately, you should keep in mind, uh, like Richard Hamming said, that the purpose of this computing is insight, not numbers. So what we're going to really develop at the end of the day is a great deal of insight into nanophotonic problems. So who should be taking this class? So if you are an undergraduate and you're interested in what I was just talking about with nanophotonics, in particular, what happens to optics when the features of the system are in the same length scale as the wavelength of light itself, uh, when you get all kinds of new and unexpected phenomena, then this would be a great class to take. Second, if you're a graduate student, and you're interested in incorporating some nanophotonic modeling or simulation into your research, whether you're an experimentalist or a theorist in different fields, and you want to kind of uh, build some bridges there, then this is a great opportunity. And then finally, if you're a practicing scientist and engineer with a lot of experience, but maybe not a specialist in nanophotonic modeling and simulation, then this would be a great way to add this to your repertoire uh, to develop either new experiments or new products. So I've been on this journey for some time now in nanophotonics, uh, and I've been uh, doing that through physics, uh, starting with my bachelor's degree at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, uh, where I was looking at uh, molecular electrostatics, and then I continued on to Cambridge University, uh, where I did my master's degree and wrote my first code on nanophotonic modeling, and was able to particularly look at uh, so-called calisteric elastomeric band structures. And then I uh, was lucky enough to go on to uh, MIT to do a PhD with John Joannopoulos on active materials in photonic crystals, which really spanned a broad range. But ultimately, I was developing like kind of new uh, modeling and simulation capabilities that were applied to a wide range of systems, which included uh, photovoltaics, thermophotovoltaics, and uh, nonlinear media and uh, devices. And uh, because I was so excited about the possibilities of nanophotonics, I stayed on at MIT as a postdoc with Marin Soljacic, and then I was uh, getting involved uh, a lot with the uh, applications of photovoltaics and thermophotovoltaics, and doing still doing modeling, but also getting involved with experiments as well to see the connection between uh, simulation and the real world. And uh, since then, I've continued on the, both of these projects uh, in photovoltaics and thermophotovoltaics as a faculty member at Purdue for the last two years and have built a, a modest size uh, seven to eight person group, which uh, is really focused on uh, nanophotonic modeling and simulation. And so let me give you an example of like why light management in photovoltaics is so important, which may not be obvious. So if you go to like a wafer-based silicon solar cell, then you see that uh, it typically is very thick on the order of 200 microns, which is uh, actually using more silicon than the electronics industry today uh, by itself. And you can see that because they have so much silicon, then that's enough to fully absorb uh, the incoming light. However, if you try to like reduce the silicon usage because silicon is expensive to purify, then unfortunately, it's not enough silicon to fully absorb light, especially in the infrared. And so then you tend to lose a lot of that light and that also degrades the uh, efficiency or performance of silicon thin film solar cells. However, if you introduce a photonic crystal-based thin film structure on the back, then that allows you to send light into uh, so-called wave-guided modes where it can be more fully absorbed. And then this work was uh, recently published last year in collaboration with Ming Hao Chi, also at Purdue. Another topic I'm very excited about is thermophotovoltaics. 
And the reason why it's so important is because it can convert heat directly into electricity. And of course, there's uh, a great deal of waste heat in the environment today. In fact, more in the United States now than there was even in 1970 because there are so many uh, mobile uses for energy nowadays and it's not converted as efficiently. And so there are a few ways in which thermophotovoltaics could have a big impact, but it's not limited to this, these three methods. First of all, there's a so-called uh, micro TPV portable power generator that could allow you to carry around a small source of fuel and then generate a great deal of power uh, through this uh, technique. And then second, a utility scale solar TPV system, which could efficiently uh, collect uh, solar heat and then convert that into electricity. And then finally, a radioisotope TPV system, which can use uh, a benign uh, radioisotope like americium-241, which is found in smoke detectors, and then convert that uh, heat into electricity without any kind of nuclear reaction. Okay, so now let me explain like kind of what are the key tools that you're going to need to know in order to study systems like that. So the first and most fundamental idea is uh, photonic crystal band structures and band gaps. And so this is uh, a picture from uh, the Joannopoulos textbook that came out a few years ago showing what a photonic crystal is. It's effectively a semiconductor for photons. And uh, you can see that you have periodic dielectric structures in 1D, 2D, and 3D here, right? So it's just very schematic at this point. And then there's many potential applications for uh, all of these dimensionalities, plus there are ways you can kind of combine them and mix them in order to get like very interesting performance. But one of the most important features of all these photonic crystal band structures is the photonic band gap. And so when you look at this band structure here, what you see is that there's a range of energies uh, that are not for allowed to be propagated through this photonic crystal structure. And then we refer to that as the photonic band gap in yellow. Okay, and then another uh, technique that's very important and uh, is very uh, computationally efficient oftentimes is called the transfer matrix type approach or also known as rigorous coupled wave analysis. And here, basically, the idea is to take a particular structure, okay, which you might uh, represent as like a series of layers, and then uh, process each layer individually. And then what's nice about looking at like one layer at a time is that it may just be a single homogeneous piece of material. So you can actually like get a much simpler analytical solution to that layer. But then the key point is in order to do something numerically, then you can couple all those layers together and then look at how does uh, light propagate from layer to layer across the boundaries using Maxwell's equations to match those boundary conditions. And so uh, this can be used not just for completely like uh, flat structures, but also for uh, structures with periodicity and a lot of other types of structures. And then one example of something that can perform this sort of calculation is a uh, cavity modeling framework, also known as CAMFER, which was originally developed at University of Hent in Belgium. And uh, IMAC is using that widely now in Belgium. Now a third technique that's very important uh, especially for my research is the finite difference time domain uh, technique. And here basically the idea is you want to simulate Maxwell's equations more or less exactly. And so the idea is that you would take uh, some sort of like computational domain and then you would break it up into little uh, uh, volume pixels or voxels, uh, which are uh, Consider it to be like a, at a certain like kind of fixed separation, which is known as the Yi lattice. And then you can kind of see schematically what the Yi lattice looks like here. And something very specific about it is that it represents uh, certain fields as being in certain positions. And then you evaluate Maxwell's equations uh, based on this so-called leapfrog uh, time integration. Okay, so that's really a key point. And then another aspect that may not be familiar to most people is that you have this so-called sigma b. And so what the sigma b represents basically is a fictitious uh, magnetic conductivity. Obviously, that doesn't exist in real life. But what it kind of gives you is the capability of having like regions uh, 
that are perfectly absorbing of all incoming light. So that's not a physical solution, but it prevents back reflection. So you can simulate uh, essentially uh, semi-infinite or infinite domains in a very reasonable amount of time. And uh, for all the details, I, I, you can of course enroll in this course and you can also look at uh, this website right here, nanohub.org, which explains uh, a specific tool to simulate this uh, finite difference time domain technique known as MEEP that I was co-developer on. And then finally, uh, we'll be talking about what are called finite element methods. And in some sense, you can consider this a generalization of the finite difference time domain, where instead of uh, fixing like each uh, voxel to be kind of uniform on a Yi lattice, you kind of generalize this solution to allow uh, these uh, structures to span like kind of different sizes. And then you can have some of these uh, uh, cells or, or finite elements much larger or smaller than the other. And so here's just an example of how if you have like kind of structural supports that are very thin in some region, then you can basically have like a very fine mesh in these regions. And then in these very thick regions where not much is happening, then you can have like very large uh, array elements. So then you can uh, have like kind of the best of both worlds in terms of the overall speed and calculation accuracy of the problem. And then this is suitable not just for uh, Maxwell's equations, but a wide variety of problems, uh, which can be thought of like as partial differential equations or like wave equations especially. So in conclusion, I think there are a lot of exciting problems and exciting techniques that we're going to explore in this class. Registration is now open. All you have to do is go to this web page, click on the link, enter your information, and then you'll be on board just in time for the class to start this September. Thank you.